tip of my tongue There's a sarcasm waiting for you Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome here to the Dark Horse DW12 Racing Series. We're here at Michigan International Speedway here. Alongside me tonight, Alex Kalnix, is Matthew Rodriguez. Hello. Welcome to the booth, Matthew. Howdy. I forgot about your last name for about a good 30 seconds there. Yeah, well, I mean... <laughs> People seem to get it wrong quite often. I like to make sure that somebody gets it right at least. <laughs> well, we've got a couple new pairings here tonight. Scott Rankin, the longtime series commentator here, has officially gone away from this league, sadly, to new commitments. And Seth Cole, who was with us last week, is covering another series. So you've got me, who's been here for a few times, and a, a new face here alongside us tonight. I mean, technically, I did commentate all of season two season three i commentated one of the all seasons uh but no i'm very excited for the uh, at least a little bit of return of michigan's always a fun fun track to get to yeah and before we really delve into michigan i feel like it's pretty important to think about what these guys have gone through from the past week going to this week because last week this series was over at richmond international raceway a half mile short track and suddenly here they are at a two-mile, essentially in these cars, a super speedway race. I mean, what what is that difference going to be for these drivers to adjust to tonight? Well, you may think it's kind of like a super speedway race where you can just hold down the throttle and you don't really have to worry about a lot of things. But reaction time. Reaction time really comes in hard here where at Richmond you had to have that reaction time to miss those split-second accidents like we saw from a, a guy L. Brooks last week. But here, it's going to be at 225, you have to have those lightning-quick reactions say, saying, hey, if a guy comes up, maybe blocks you a little bit, you have to be ready to either jump out of the throttle or just plain get out of the way. Yeah, it's a huge difference here tonight. As last week, it was a lot more about managing your own equipment, managing your tires and everything else. But this week, I feel like the bigger questions are going to be, you know, how do you handle the drafting package and how is fuel going to come into handy tonight as these guys are going to be back to back drafting off each other, most likely going to be riding around in fifth and sixth gear the entire time. And so that fuel saving, whatever you can do outside of being the leader is going to be massive to how your race plays out. Extremely, as we just keep going through the starting lineup, you got to have... Really, the the few names that you already know are going to make a big splash in this race. Uh, Nick DeGroote, he's already on pole. He is ready to really just rock out in this race. Same thing, you have Matt Wagner, guy to kind of keep an eye on a little bit. Uh, I, I'm really thinking my dark horse here, and surprisingly enough, as ironic as it is, my dark horse has to be Rick Ravon for quite obvious reasons. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, Rick, Rick Ravon has kind of come into this series after a bit of a hiatus and immediately has shown some amazing speed but here tonight we're seeing a total difference in the racing style that could pretty much allow anybody to run at the front of the field but something that seems to be consistent is Nick DeGroot at the front because he's our points leader he came out of last week the points leader with even a bigger gap than the week prior and he's been very very consistent this year and he's already starting off well at this race and that's the just looking through the field I really think if Eric Schaus can kind of kick that, <laughs> really, the uh, the monkey off his back, he could probably get a good top 10 here. But every time we talk about him, he ends up putting in the fence. Really hope for better luck. Green flag is out. Green flag's out. Nick DeGroote leads the field away, though he's being run down on the outside by Yari Brupacher. Yari Brupacher already with a good qualifying performance out front today. Eric Peterson behind him is going to slot in line. He's going to draft off the back bumper of Nick DeGroote as they go through turns one and two. Gary Brupacher's going to have to fall in line in the back there, but they're racing side-by-side side behind them. Guile Brooks coming up through the field a little bit now. 
And there's just crazy racing already. These guys are already going too wide, about to be three wide in a second here. And Charles Teed coming on the bottom of three and four. And you just see how far they fan out. Everyone's trying just a little bit. Now, you got to think here. You can get an amazing run off of draft. But once you get up to that back bumper, where do you go? Do you ride behind him like Charles Teed is doing? Or do you push it all the way to the high side like Yari is doing? You got a lot of options here tonight, but something interesting, I'm watching Charles Teed. He didn't make the move when he drafted up initially. He just kind of stayed in line. I mean, that's going to be something that I'm going to be watching out for guys doing to see if they're going to be saving fuel. But, I mean, as they singled out there, he took it to the outside and is looking for the lead, but it's just not going to have enough of a run around that outside. Here comes Yari back up the inside, just behind just behind Nick Look at that, Groot. four is wide in the back. It? I mean, it's just going to be all over the place tonight. We're going to be looking all over the place. I'm going to talk about the lead a good bit because that's where the action is going to be. Almost five wide in the middle of the pack. My gosh, these guys are all over the place. And that's just so much battling for position. But you got to think, with that faster pair, that has emboldened these guys. Are, they're willing to take a little bit of risk earlier on in the race. But uh, you got to kind of have that ear, or kind of that voice in your head saying, hey, it is lap three as you see Charles T make an aggressive move to the bottom. Yeah, these guys at the front are wanting to stay right up at the front looking for the track position because there is a very light, high likelihood that we do get a wreck here. I mean, there's so much squabbling. There's so much back and forth, three, four wide at times. There's plenty of opportunities to crash, and so that track position could be crucial at keeping your car clean. And then just looking from almost the driver's perspective, I mean, just look at all the chaos in front of you. You got three by three. And same thing, you're going about 225 in this scenario. You're just trying to find this, a little bit of an area to get through. As a driver, and I have to say at a driver, in your mentality, what do you do in this kind of situation? You've got three by three. You see a gap in the middle. Do you take it? Well, I think normally when you get three by three, you, as a driver behind, you just don't want to go anywhere. You don't want to take that big of a risk. I mean, some guys might want to do it. You know, if they see enough of a gap to stick the car in there as safe as they can, they're going to take it. But... Often guys will just kind of sit there and, and wait for it to kind of clear out a little bit. But here at Michigan, it just seems to be it keeps going no matter what. I mean, the only time it starts to single out a bit is in the middle of the corners. And then it immediately goes back to three and four wide around there. And I know it's hard to take your eyes off the front of the field, but an interesting development I'm seeing towards the back of the field is Matt Wagner is staying all the way in the back, way out of the action back there. He's had a bad couple weeks with crashes and incidents, so he's just kind of staying out of this one as... Who knows if that luck is going to bite him in this one. Realistically, I'm seeing the biggest mover has to be A.J. Hobson here at the moment. A.J. Hobson started all the way back in 16th, finally has worked his way up to second place. And as we heard in that onboard, he was lifting a, just a little bit in the corner, so I don't think he's ready to go to that lead yet. I mean, yeah, I mean, when you come from that far back, you're kind of just trying to get up into the front of the field just to keep yourself out of trouble because that mid-pack is where a lot of stuff's going to happen. I mean, there's two drivers up here that started outside the top 10, AJ Hobson and Eric Schaus in that bright green car. Both of those drivers started pretty deep in the field, 16th and 13th respectively, and here they are racing just inside the top five. Now, I know we're a little bit more used to NASCAR kind of ovals and NASCAR super speedways in that kind of sense. What can you pull from a track, let's say, like a super speedway like Daytona and Talladega and take to an IndyCar open-wheel mindset at Michigan? I mean, that's a bit of a tricky question, as you don't really have that ability to bump each other. You don't have that kind of safety net around you. You have to be a lot more careful with your moves. You have to make sure you leave more of a gap, as any little incident can cause a massive wreck. But here in Michigan, I mean, this is a very, very wide racetrack compared to, say, Daytona, for example. You've got almost two extra lanes to move around and do things, which is why we're able to see such comfortable three-wide and even sometimes four-wide racing. And I'm just seeing that train on the bottom now line, but I do see a few drivers kind of taking that high road either to drop back in the pack, or do you think there's something up there? I mean, I think sometimes it could just be... You know, you have nowhere else to go, so you just go up to the top. I mean, we saw Eric Schaus shove it four wide for the lead and kind of put A.J. Hobson all the way up there. And as he fell back, he fell back in line into the middle to the third lane over there. So I don't think you want to be all the way on top, but if it's your only option, it's your only option. And you see Jim Herrick there in the 40. He has been riding around here, but he has been sporting some new colors this week. You think that's going to be a little... I, I, drivers are just so superstitious where I swear I keep want to I want to keep running this paint scheme because I swear I got luck in it. <laughs> oh, you see Nick DeGroote shove almost Charles Teed all the way down to the apron. 
Nah, I'm, uh, that's something that I heard about in the driver's meeting is that these drivers are not allowed to advance positions below that white line. They don't want anybody taking the apron to make passes. So Charles Teat's going to have to receive the position, which he does off turn four. That allows Eric Schaus to make a massive run to the lead going around the outside of Nick DeGroote. And I swear, I know Eric Schaus's luck. He really needs to be hoping for all of it here at the moment. He almost throws a block on Charles Teat up top. He has Herrick behind him, but right now it looks like Eric Schaus is kind of in that pigeonhole in the middle. Yeah, but I, it's honestly, I kind of like that position there in the middle. You don't have a huge way to turn your front tires. You kind of run it pretty comfortably, but you're not all the way on top that it's a super long way around. Find that bottom lane, you put a lot more strain on those front tires because it's got a little bit less banking. And just seeing pretty much three by three. Now you got to wonder who is really trying to play the strategy game here. Were you seeing uh, AJ Hobson kind of ride rack? back maybe third second row in that lane just trying to i'm guessing save fuel here how much fuel can you really save in an all out track like michigan well i mean for the leader for example nick de groot there's pretty much no fuel saving you just want to run as quickly as you can to try and stay out front and keep track position oh as charles t oh got in the jeff's the high way. song in the side high song took a trip through the grass he came he came back out of the track but he just lost a ton of time. Luckily, the pack is so strung out, he's going to be able to hook onto the very back of the pack and stay with everybody. Thankfully for him, that's not going to totally end his night, but it's going to keep him out of the front pack for a moment's being. And just taking a look back at the replay there, and it really just looked like Charles Teed may have just gotten a little bit loose. Or, oh, actually, no, it was Eric Schaus on the top side. Eric Schaus moved down a little bit, hit Charles Teed in the front, and that came all the way down to Jeff Hysong, and Hysong is the one who played the, paid the price for it. That's very fortunate for those drivers to not make an incident, as usually any contact essentially will send these cars around. So that was extremely lucky for them to not wreck, as they're four wide for the second position up there. Eric Schaus keeps sending it four wide, looking for spots. He is not at all scared of crashing today. Well, that's the one thing. I mean, we say it all the time, where half part is half skill and half other part is confidence. I mean, if you have confidence that you know what you're doing, but you're going to be putting the car where it needs to be, and hey, you can win a few races, but if you're scared of what your car can do, you're probably not going to have that much success. I mean, I'm seeing two different strategies up here. I'm seeing Eric Schaus looking for any spot he could get, and then I'm seeing Charles Teed. The moment he sees three wide, he backs out of it and doesn't want to take it four wide. So we're seeing two different strategies up here in the front and two different levels of aggression, which can really come in to create a bit of chaos here. And that's the thing, just differing strategies. Differing strategies throws headaches throughout the rest of the field. But you've got to look at this second pack that is really kind of broken away. It's ninth on back, and that is just a whole gaggle of cars. But I can't figure out if they have just either lost the draft due to maybe one of those uh, high song incidents through the grass where they may have just got a little bit scared and lifted, or if they really have a different plan here. Well, a couple of the guys back here are, you know, <laughs> race contending drivers, I mean, and championship contending in the case of Matt Wagner. You know, you just have guys back here trying to stay out of it. They're not racing nearly as aggressive. You know, they're making a couple moves here and there, but they're not going all over the place. So it looks like they're just trying to preserve their stuff. Although I'm seeing a bit of a change of position towards the front. Rick Ravon, who is back in that pack, is now up in the front of the field racing inside the top five. And this is what we talked about with Rick Ravon. He kind of just hangs back a little bit until he finds his groove and he slowly starts working his way up. Now, you got to think, he is one of those guys who usually plays that strategy game. Why is he making that charge towards the front? Well, I'm seeing him here. He's not taking it to the outside. He's actually backing off a little bit of A.J. Hobson and just staying in line. So that's a bit of a strategy right there. It's just to preserve your fuel, stay in the draft, and stay in line. It might be the most ideal strategy for him to make it longer than most of these other drivers. See, everyone's getting ready to do their uh, kind of staking on the inside line. Now, you really think, has this pack kind of settled out a little bit? We're very willing to ride now, but they've gotten all that raciness out. Well, I, I think the one thing as well is that you're dealing with the older Michigan racetrack. This is not the newer Michigan racetrack. As we're passing around the outside almost for the lead. Rick Ravon with a massive run towards the front. Suddenly, he went from hanging out around back there to suddenly wanting to take the lead now. 
Well, that's a big thing is here at Legacy Michigan, the track's a little bit older, grains a little bit more, and does hurt the tires a little bit more than the new Michigan. So we could be seeing some handling going away for some of these drivers. And I saw with Charles Teed the hesitation that you have going on the outside of someone trying to cut down try to get that side draft off him as much as you can and then just the just seeing the little bobble on the bottom just lifting and being extremely cautious because you know hey you don't want to be that guy who ends up getting just taken out by someone getting a little bit loose yeah i, I they're not giving us a lot of time to talk about stuff here so i'm going to try and talk about it as quickly as possible <laughs> is that when when you are racing side by side like that it's really really sketchy because you want to give enough space to allow them to move their own car around and not wreck you especially here at this racetrack but you want to get as close as possible to try and drag them back as much as you can so it's kind of a a conflict of interest in a sense how much do you trust the driver to you inside and how much do you trust your ability to hold the car in a straight line as well well that's the thing where uh, you can talk about it in some of the other leagues that we race and some of the other leagues that we broadcast. Oh, what? Which, contact oh, in the back. That was Jim that was Herrick. Jim Her yeah, Jim Herrick got knocked up into the outside wall. Luckily, he kept it going and only has very, very minimal damage. But, man, that was another incident that could have ended up being a wreck that just happened to not be one. And then just taking a look back, it looks like really that Jim Herrick may have gotten at least a little bit squeezed into the wall. We'll see here in just a moment. See here on the exit of two, Jim Herrick tries to get that good run on the outside. AJ Hobson throws that little bit of a block and just scraping the wall. Right side pods, probably a little bit damaged, but it looks like my wing is all good. Oh, that was just one of those moments right there where you feel comfortable in these cars. You've got all that downforce there on the front end of the race car. Somebody drives up in front of you and suddenly dumps all that dirty air in your front end. You get super tight. And you're already in the throttle. There's not much left you could do by that point in the corner. Now you're seeing Jim Hare kind of drop like a rock here. And you kind of have to think, is he either being cautious or is that side pod damage really affecting the speed or the handling on that car? I, I think the damage is definitely going to be affecting him a, a, at least a little bit. Because, I mean, these guys are full throttle around here for the most part. Maybe only lifting a little bit in the corners if you're in some dirty air. So, I mean, you... <laughs> You don't have a lot of opportunity to make it up in the corners as even in the corners, you're pretty much full throttle. And still seeing the Groot still continues to dominate the field. CT on his way back now, racing door to door, or at least wheel to wheel with Eric Schaus and AJ Hobson. Yeah, there's an absolute mix of drivers up here, but there's been a few drivers pretty consistently, and the driver the most consistent has been Nick DeGroote, our leader. Though I, I am a little bit worried about his fuel mileage, as he's been running pretty much fifth gear around that bottom lane the entire race so far. Everybody else behind him has been running sixth gear and saving their fuel, lifting out a little bit to stay in line. You know, Nick DeGroote is just wanting to keep the track position. He's really committing to that strategy. Well, that's a really big thing is, is he banking on a caution to kind of bail him out and equalize the strategy? Or you have some of these guys maybe farther back in the pack, think of maybe an, uh, kind of an A.J. Hobson or maybe a, a Matt Wagner kind of strategy of, hey, we're going to try maybe short pit, we're going to try and do the undercut, we're going to see if that works, see what other advantages we can get. Yeah, I mean, you can't understate as well the fact that, you know, you don't have to take full fuel every time you pit. You can short fuel it a little bit and try and have a faster pit stop and gain track position purely off of that though i'm hearing the leader nick de groot having a pit in at the quarter mark of this race so he'll have to make on this amount of fuel at least two more stops on top of this one so that's an interesting strategy to note that these drivers are not going to be able to make it enough to split this race in into uh thirds and have less pit stops, it doesn't look like. Looks like Charles Teed's also coming down. I believe that was Jim Brooks who also dove down behind him. Yeah, Luis Nun Gonzalez Nunez behind him and Jim Herrick also pit in at the same time. So that's the four drivers that came in on this pit stop. I'm hearing Yari Brupacher's coming into the pit lane, Gaio Brooks as well. So it seems like this is the time for pit stops and that these drivers are not going to be able to make it far enough to about lap 33 34 to be able to take a pit stop pit stop off this run now having a partner is not as important as it is in really super speedway racing and the full body stock cars however indy cars that dancing partner is required to can maintain those speeds about 220 230 yeah you typically do want to at least pit in with one person as around here something we hear a lot about is tag teaming where 
you have somebody out front and then a second person who drafts off you and passes you and you guys go back and forth around the lap, that's kind of, this racetrack is where that's key. And so you kind of want to pit in at least with one other person as we're seeing a bunch of drivers at the front of the field. Pretty much the entire front of the field is coming into the pit lane. I and mean, then just look at that. Everyone's trying to find a little bit of space. Just a fast repair update. Jim Herrick has taken his fast repair. All right. Well, he's going to have a nice fresh race car, so he won't be totally out of this race, excluding a crash again. Although one driver who stayed out, Gael Brooks, has not come into the pit lane. I thought I heard him coming into the pit lane. He must have uh, either missed it the first time or is staying out to try and see if he could maybe short his fuel load a little bit. But he's going to be pitting lap 29 to lap 30 so he's getting closer to splitting the race into thirds but it's just not going to be enough and that's the big killer that we also have to pay attention to here which is pit road penalties you know obviously everyone wants to maximize that entrance in the pit road but you have to be careful make sure that you abide by that speed limit yeah that's a really crucial thing to make sure that you minimize any problems with is making sure that you get on and off pit road with no issues this car it's really, really hard to get on the brakes very hard for the pit lane. You have to be very careful. It's very easy to lock the front tires. And so if you're going to see a lot of people make mistakes, it's going to be on that pit road entry especially. And even out of the pit box, this car is very, very snappy on throttle coming out of the pit box as well. Well, I am looking, and it looks like Gael Brooks, who stayed out on his own, is actually going to come out in the second position. So that seemed like a pretty decent strategy call for him, as he did not lose much la track position and actually almost looked like he gained some, even though he didn't come in with anybody. So I think he just had a pretty phenomenal pit cycle there. So now this is really going to shuffle up the order. Nick DeGroot, who was our leader going into the pit cycle, is all the way down to the fifth position now. We'll have to see how he behaves inside of the draft because for the entire race so far, he'd been out front of the field leading everybody by a good margin. He didn't have to deal with much traffic. And so now he's going to be racing in a completely different environment. It's going to be a matter of how he adapts to this. But it looks like he's already making the move for the second position. Yeah, my apologies. I didn't realize I had my mute button on. But really, the thing that really hurt Gail Brook or uh, Gail Brooks in opposition to Rick Ravon has to be the pit lane time. Rick Ravon really pushed it on pit road, got a 31.3 second lane to lane exit entry to exit time, while uh, Brooks he ended up pulling a 32.3. Now that doesn't sound like that big of a difference, but that fraction of a second means the entire difference between coming up P1 and P6. Yeah, but ultimately, this draft is definitely the determiner of who's going to be leading this race. As you saw Rick Ravon, who came out first from the pit lane with a massive lead, just immediately got caught up to and passed by two drivers. Now Charles Teed is our leader, and he's going to want to try and hold the bottom like Nick DeGroote did, because if you're able to run fifth gear and make it all the way to lap 26 on fuel, that's a good sign for you if this stays green. Yes, and realistically, the thing that I am focusing on here has to be that both DeGroote and Teed were one of the first ones to kick off that pit cycle, and the undercut seems to have not really affected and even benefited Teed. Yeah, especially for Charles Teed, because it kind of disheveled the entire field and kind of mixed everybody up for a short period of time. Now that everybody's closing up again and we're starting to get this big pack, the leader has that big advantage of just being able to run the bottom the whole time, and it's really, really hard to pass as... You're not allowed to pass below that line, so you've got to try and figure out how you can make that move around the outside. Now, here's the thing that you've got to kind of figure in. Is Teed possibly going to try and control the flow of the race? Now, what I mean by that is these cars, we know they're capable of about 225, 230. But right now, I've been seeing Teed really top out about 220 miles an hour, and no one behind him has really made the, any effort to pass. So is he just trying to slow down the field, maybe to conserve a little bit of fuel mileage, or... I mean, we saw Nick DeGroote last time just run fifth gear full throttle almost the entire time and make it all the way to lap 26. So I see no reason as to why you'd want to back it up because you don't really have to worry too, too much about your fuels. You're going to have to make two more pit stops anyway. If anything, I would want... I would almost be curious if that is what he's doing. I would say that almost benefits his competitors more as some of these other drivers made it all the way to lap 30. I almost wonder if Teed wants someone else to lead the pack 
But the same thing with Rayvon. Rayvon doesn't want to leave. He really, he wants to get as much fuel mileage out of his car as possible. And you got to think right now of how this weather is. There is no humidity out on this track. This is an engine engine's paradise. It has full power. It is trying to pump out as much power as possible and is not restricted at all. So you got to think we're just burning through gas as fast as possible. Yeah, I mean, that's a massive, massive deal is being able to run the track with such clear air. I mean, you'll severely underestimate just how much the humidity makes a difference until you try it, and then suddenly you realize just how massive a fuel mileage difference it really is. And we saw that because we saw the, the leaders come in lap 26, but then we saw, in the case of Guile Brooks, go all the way to lap 30. So that's a massive difference in pace in terms of fuel saving and everything else. And so being able to back up your pace enough, we might be able to see somebody stretch it out and more than anything, have a really, really short final pit stop. I keep noticing a Nick the group. Every time we enter turn one, he is really running that aggressively high line. He's doing it right now in three and four. He is running that aggressively high line. And I'm trying to figure out if he's just trying to scrub, scrub off speed or if he, if it's some other strategy. Well, he could just be trying to get a massive run as well as around the top side. You're not turning nearly as much as towards the bottom. So you're able to straighten the car out going down the straightaway early and get this really long draft from the car in front of you and try and make these massive runs as he's doing right now. I mean, he just passed Rick Ravon pretty comfortably and he was ahead of Charles Teed going into turn three. So clearly there's some method to his madness. Absolutely. Now I have to keep looking at this photo. I'm wondering, is this the big three? But no, seeing Teed out front, Teed has had really a up and down stellar season. Got a slow start to the season, but slowly ended up rebounding back. Yeah, especially since when you look at his points position, he's farther down the order, but he's lost an extra start compared to everybody else who's had eight starts. He's had only seven. So despite... His lower start count, he is a lot higher in the points than you may expect him to be sitting there in the 13th position and has had some pretty decent performances. He's had a pole position in the past and has had a top five finish as well. So he's ran pretty solidly in races past. It's just a matter of he's not been here as much as some of these other drivers. You know, I'm just kicking my legs up here and I'm thinking about that Indy 500 all these drivers do at the end of the season. And that is still a points-paying race that these drivers can fight for the championship for. We have not had a really a championship season where all the championship has come down to Indy. This might be the season where it happens. I mean, it could be the season where it happens because when you look at the front of the standings, Nick DeGroote, who's currently sitting there in third racing for the second position, he is leading the points by 76 points. I mean, that is a pretty big margin especially when you're consistently finishing out front and the margins position to pit position are just not big enough to really catch up to him even if you finish ahead of him so he's having a pretty solid season and if he has enough good fortune in the coming weeks compared to his competitors he could come away with the championship before we even try and make up the iowa race at the end of the season so i'll ask you this question because i i think this is more pertinent to personal preference Two laps to go. What position do you want to be in? Uh, preferably, I would say... I mean, it depends on the race situation. I'd say second more generally, but if they're side-by-side, side, I'd say third. I'd say I, I think I want to be in almost like a fourth or fifth kind of situation. I kind of as a two or three guys start to duke it out, you kind of have that freedom as the fourth or fifth guy in line to really kind of make those gigantic run out of nowhere just trying to pass all of them. And well, vice versa, being the leader, you kind of have control of what line you're going to use. You will be at a speed disadvantage, but you can lock them out to a more difficult line in less space. Well, I'm, I would agree with you had this been a standard official iRacing session, but one of the key rules that, as a driver, I'm keeping in my head the entire time is the fact that I can't go below that white line onto the apron to make moves. If the track gets covered, I have nowhere to go. If these drivers all stack up two, three, four wide, and I have nowhere to go, well, I have nowhere to go. So I'd rather be in those second and third spots and have the opportunity to move somewhere, as I know there's simply not enough cars ahead of me to block up the track. 
I'll also pull a counterpoint where you gotta remember this league does not carry any green white checkers so what you see is the advertised distance that is the end we don't go any further than that so thinking of Charles Teed here if a caution comes out with two or three to go I mean that's pretty much race one well, I think by that point in the race, they're going to be racing so hard. You're going to see a lot of guys get these massive runs on the leader and be ahead of them at various points in the lap. Maybe not for the entire lap, but enough time that if a caution were to come out at that instance, you could be the winner of the race. So I would still prefer to be in that farther back spot as I'd have the opportunity to at least make the move for the lead and possibly even take it. And we're coming up to our really open up our second pit window here in about five, ten laps. So, so judging off that first pit stops and really seeing how most of the field, they have now collapsed back together. Now, here's the two things I want to keep in mind, which is seeing the undercut that was done by both T and the group last time. Do you think that would be valuable to do it this time if you have the really the capability of maybe at lap 50 say, all right, I'm going to come in now? Or I also got to think about some of the guys who are further back in the pack that have, have been running about 220, 230 this entire time trying to catch this field. Did they burn more fuel than the guys up front? Well, I mean, we saw both of that. We saw the guys come in first and retain their positions towards the front of the field for the most part. But then we also saw drivers stay out a lot longer and then once again be out front of the field. The big difference maker seemed to be your speed entering and exiting the pit lane and how fast your pit stop was. So I think it doesn't really matter as long as you come in with at least one person. You should be able to make up your spots and at least retain where you are and just make sure that you get on and off pit road as fast as possible. And no, I'm just waiting for the calm before the storm. You see everyone right now. I'm riding on board with AJ Hobson. You hear him lifting out of the throttle. You hear him taking it easy, kind of giving everyone a little bit of room. When do you think the other hat starts to drop at maybe like 10 to go? Do you finally just say, hey, I'm not lifting anymore? I mean, I think, considering this racetrack and how long of a lap it is, I would start going at about five or six to go. Because I think ten laps to go, you kind of put yourself in a bit of a vulnerable position as there's plenty of time that if you make a move and enough drivers are not ready to make moves yet, you could get yourself shuffled out of line and wait to the back of the field. So I would wait until that breaking point in the race where everybody agrees it's time to go and everybody's scattering all over the place. And just seeing how much these cars are moving around the front. On the wide angle, it doesn't look like they're moving around that much. But once you get closer, you can just see all the little twitches in the wheel and as they go up and down the track. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to understate just how much the air affects these race cars. You know, you get one draft for a second and you start flying forward. But then you start to slow up a little bit. The wheel wiggles a little bit. Maybe you just want to give yourself a little extra time to react and so you move a little bit higher and that's what a lot of these drivers are doing you know maybe even dirty air as well dirty air as well forcing you to lift out of the throttle a little bit maybe washing you up the track all these little things are causing these cars to move all over the place which does make it really really sketchy to try and make maneuvers sometimes when you got to think even though we do have a faster pair here you just got to imagine the, the the consequences of wrecking where you could possibly bend in the wheel and make this thing undrivable back to pit road I mean, that is a risk that you have to deal with. Even though you have that fast pair in the bank, can you make it back to pit road? Well, uh, a bit of an update that we're seeing is that it seems like some of these drivers already are going to start making it down the pit lane. I'm seeing Nunez saying he's going to come down the pit lane. I just heard that Jim Herrick say he was going to come down the pit lane. I think I, we just caught somebody on the camera there coming down the pit lane and here comes Charles Teed our leader coming into the pit lane as well so he's taking the risk of stopping a little bit early but what's interesting is these drivers went a little bit further than their first stint they made it all the way to lap 53 coming through the pit lane so they were able to make it a little bit further than last time and you got to think Teed was kind of the really I think the scapegoat up front where he had to do that now you got to think if you work yourself in a way where you saved enough fuel to possibly make that next stop, your last stop, could you possibly be in an excess of fuel? Would it be worth it to take less fuel just to make the car a little bit lighter? I mean, I think that's going to be the key for a lot of these guys that stay out a bit longer. Although, unfortunate for Nick DeGroot, almost nobody came into the pit lane with him. The only person to come in with him was Matt Wagner, but he was about two seconds off the pack. So he is going to lose a bit of time running solo by himself there. 
and as I'm seeing Charles Teed come off the pit lane, he came in in the pack. So he's in the middle of the pack, one lap down, and he's going to catch the draft before these guys even come into the pit lane. See, this is kind of a dangerous scenario for Charles Teed, where if a wreck happens now, he's kind of in that precarious position where he's back in the pack. But there's really no drive for him to push through the field here at the moment. I mean, really, all you need to do is just ride around, let your pit, let your pit strategy play out, and get your lap back that way. Yeah, this is a big benefit as well, as I saw Nick DeGroot as well managed to find his way into the pack as well. So luckily, his solo pit stop is not going to knock him out of this one. Is that right here, because you pit early and you're completely off cycle from everybody else, you don't need to worry about making maneuvers. You could fully commit to saving fuel, and that could be key at the end of the race on having that shorter pit stop and finding yourself a lot of track position. That's a name that we really haven't talked about today, Eric Peterson. He has just kind of been slowly snaking his way through the field. Started P3, currently running negative one to his position. But Eric Peterson's one of those guys that just kind of hangs around there and just gets caught in bad luck. Well, I mean, he can't have the worst luck because I'm just checking on the standings to see where he stands. He's at six starts, yet he's eighth in the points. I mean, he is massively up in the points despite how little starts he has. That's two full race worth of starts, and yet he's still in the top 10 in the points. So Eric Peterson, it must be a very consistent driver as he comes in the pit lane with a massive chunk of the field here. Oh, that's definitely a different tale from previous seasons. Previous seasons, it has been a story of how could this go wrong and how many ways can it go wrong? As you currently see the Brooks, the Brooks family currently leading nose to tail. Actually, my apologies. That is, <laughs> that is wrong. My apologies. My, uh, my plum tree is a little bit messed up. That was Nick DeGroote you saw at the front of the field as Rick Ravon currently leads. But you got to think here. Everyone's kind of coming out of their own general little pack here. So you think it's going to be a little bit closer, a little bit more tight racing now because everyone's more condensed together. Yeah, I think this lead right now is currently going to be between Nick DeGroote, Charles Teed, Eric Schaus, and Rick Ravon. Those are the four drivers right up here at the front of the field who have already pit and have their own strategy set. They're a good chunk ahead of the drivers behind and Eric Peterson and AJ Hobson who are further back and also pit as well. The key here is just don't create a caution because you're racing around a lot of guys who still need to come into the pit lane and you can't risk having a caution come out because these guys are gonna have to make that left-hand turn onto the pit lane. And so you gotta be careful you give them the space to do that. We well, gotta think about it. Last season where I believe it was Matt Wagner, if I remember correctly, Matt Wagner had this thing all but one with fuel strategy and that late race caution came out and that basically threw away an easy win for him. Yeah, it kind of almost sounds like the story of Matt Wagner, at least in the later part of this year, is he's shown so much competitive prowess only to have some unfortunate circumstances or a missed call on strategy knock him out of the race win or just even a crash like we saw last week at Richmond. And so far in this race, he's been further back in the pack, just kind of been hanging around, but he's been just close enough that if he were to decide to push it, he could find his way back into the lead pack. So that may be a driver we need to talk about here at the end of the race. Absolutely, as you pretty much said. And just looking at this front pack, it looks like everyone's kind of in that fuel-saving mode here at the moment. Just trying to conserve as much as possible. As you see, it looks like... Yes, that is one of the uh, Gael Brooks leaving pit road. Now he is rejoining the pack. He is still on the lead lap and looks like everything is cycled out. Yep, every single driver now is back into the lead lap and is racing at the front of the field. Though for Gael Brooks, I've been relatively impressed with his pit cycles as he's pretty much come in well after everybody else entirely on his own and has found his way immediately back at the front of the field. And while he hasn't retained to that position at the very front, has decided to kind of keep himself in the middle of the pack he's a driver that's able to come out of those pit stops with a good stop and good track position so coming on to this last stop i'm going to be watching him now i'm just looking back in the pack there's currently about a 1.5 second gap between eric schaus and eric peterson and you gotta think that's kind of weighing on peterson's head here where peterson's now breaking the air from his field where he is basically getting the same amount of fuel mileage as the leader but you gotta think you can't let that front pack get away too far or you really kind of shot yourself in the foot, and looking at that front pack, everyone's really almost single-filed out. They will start pulling away here soon. 
Yeah, and if they do start racing, that will give the opportunity for the second pack to pull up. As we saw just before the end of the pit cycle last time by, there was a second pack that was well off the front of the field and managed to find their way back up to the front. So they're going to have to be careful to make sure that they don't allow them to do that, as that's a good number of drivers back there who just aren't able to catch up at the moment. Extremely, you see Rick Ravon trying to make that charge in the outside. Nunez, same thing, trying to follow Ravon a little bit, seeing if he can kind of make that outside line work, maybe taking it three. No, no, make it two. No, we're going back to three. As Charles Teed gaining a little bit more confidence as this race has gone on, now taking it three wide up the middle, around the outside of Rick Ravon, very close between Ravon and Teed. There was almost contact there to the left rear of Charles Teed, but he manages to find himself in the second spot. Now he's going for the lead around the outside. He's going to struggle down here going through turns one and two. It's going to be a matter of who does Rick Ravon go with? Does he go with Charles Teed to try and get the run around the outside? Does he take a three wide or does he just continue to fall in line with Nick DeGroote? Looks like he's going to hold in line on the bottom. I will say I've had the pleasure of racing alongside Teed. And Teed is no stranger to making those bold moves of, should I put it where other drivers may think, should I put it here? <laughs> Teed's going to say, I'm going to put it here and it's going to stick. We saw a different story of that, though, earlier in the race as he was being very, very cautious. But I think now that he's gotten more comfortable with everybody and starting to trust everybody's driving here later on in the race, he's now making much more confident moves as he's stuck around the outside and nicked the group for a whole lap. Now he finally slots back in line after falling back into turn one. but he And immediately goes back around the outside. He doesn't even give me, give me enough time to speak. And just leading two by two, trying to make sure... Some of these drivers are probably pretty sure about their fuel strategy and they're willing to go and battle it out right now. But you got to think the real battle is really going to come in about last 10 laps. I'd say really about this time is when I'd start using my time to experiment a little bit. Trying to see, all right, if I run up here and I get a little bit of draft, how quickly can I come from P5 to P1 in this short amount of time? Or can I do it even? Well, I think that's what we saw with Nick DeGroote earlier on, running all the way around the top in the corners and then falling back in line on the straightaways, looking to get those massive runs. It worked for a little bit, but then ultimately taking that very, very high line, knocked them back into the field. So that could be something we see as we see drivers kind of fan out later on in the race, trying to look for some time back down the straightaways. But something I am watching that I haven't seen very often is Charles T being able to hang around the outside when he does run that lower lane kind of closer to Nick the group. He almost seems to get a draft from the side that isn't pulling him back, pulling uh, DeGroote back, but pulling Teed forward. And that's something that I hadn't seen from any other drivers so far, but he's doing a pretty good job of hanging it around in that second lane. And you gotta think these drivers probably about 10, 15 more laps on this pit cycle before they're really starting to really plan their stops here. But you gotta think who's gonna really try and cut that to the razor's edge pit as early as possible, trying to get that undercut just to make sure that they can get off pit road first. I mean, there could be that strategy as well, or there could be running it as far as possible and waiting for the pack and simply just taking less fuel as the tires do change a little bit quicker than the fuel does. So you're able to take a little bit less fuel while still taking tires. Or maybe if you trust it enough, you could just take straight fuel and just run on the older tires as you're not really dealing with too, too much tire wear compared to some other races we've had. And Nunez is one of those drivers who are just kind of riding around here at the moment. Just trying to weigh the waters. He has made a few attempts trying to get up front, but nothing extremely serious. Just waiting for him to really kind of buckle down, but he's one of those drivers that I'd be on the lookout for. Yes, I'm, I'm going to say the same thing about the drivers at the back of this lead pack, Jim Brooks and Guile Brooks. I haven't talked about them too, too much outside of the pit cycles, but they've just kind of been hanging out at the front of the field, but not racing for positions at the front, just kind of relaxing up there. And they've done a good job at keeping up with the front of the field without pushing their stuff and taking too many risks. So we'll have to see when they turn that switch on, because at a certain point, they might be a little bit too far back to make the moves. I will say that's the one advantage about having family is that you always have the kind of that second mind that is willing to go with you. The only part, the bad part about having family that races together is you always want to beat the other and you're willing to do just about anything to do it. Well, I mean, <laughs> I suppose there is all that as well, but when you're dealing with some super speedway racing, I feel like the family ties go a little bit better than the family rivalries in this case, but 
They're going to have to watch out, though, because these drivers at the front have been very, very competitive, especially Charles T. Nick DeGroot, who have been the two drivers so far to lead the most laps of the rest of the drivers in the field and been able to hold the lead for the longest amount of time. So those two drivers are going to be very, very hard to pass, especially whichever one of them gets to the bottom lane first, as they've been really, really strong and haven't had much opportunity to get past. I realistically say that Rick Ravon probably has something sitting in the tank because he's just been riding back here, just getting as much fuel as possible. Another one of those, again, dark horses that I kind of want to bring up is Matt Wagner, Jim Herrick. Those two that Jim Herrick did have that little bit of damage earlier on, did use that fast repair, but he is currently running middle of that second pack. And almost with Matt Wagner, Wagner's been known for some fuel trickery before. I would not be surprised to see it again. Yeah, I mean, that's all he's been doing this entire race has been right at the very, very back of the pack. And so really all you can do by that point is just sit there and save fuel as if you're not going for spots. There's no reason to kick it into fifth gear. And so you're sitting there saving fuel pretty much the entire time. So on this final pit stop, I expect him to try and jump up some track position by taking a little bit less fuel. And if not, I'd be frankly surprised. But at the moment, that second pack has officially caught up to this lead pack. They're now within the race at the front of the field. And you got to think here, every time that we get to this point, about 20 laps in this run, we keep having these guys pop up, and it's a constant battle. So if we follow this trend, I'd say probably about lap 95, we'll see the entire field battling it out for the last few laps. Yeah, and that's a, pretty much exactly the lap that I said that I would start battling at. So, I mean, if it comes down to that, that's pretty convenient timing for some of these drivers who have been a little bit slower on the pit cycles because it seems to be even if you are slower you manage to catch right back up you see aj hobson leading the outside line with herrick and it looks like peterson as well they're trying to make that outside line work really no avail here really it's a bottom field feed track unless you got that draft for the run on the outside yeah what would you say is the frustration at least in your case of just knowing that the bottom lane is so strong, but you know that maybe if you get lucky enough, you can make that move around the outside, but it just never seems to work out. Well, it's more or less, it can work, but you have to be highly aggressive. You really have to go right down on the side pot of the guy and really try to steal as much air off that car as possible while continuing to advance, and you have to be very aggressive. You see Rick Ravon pull out. That's the most aggressiveness that I have to talk about is that's how aggressive you have to be to fight your way in front of that guy on the preferred line. It is tough, and it's really one of those moves that you can only pull a few times before people start getting angry. Yeah, and it doesn't seem like Charles Cheat is willing to work with any of them either. He's going around the outside, taking it three wide, but the difference is I'm seeing Rayvon run a lot closer to Nick DeGroote in the corners, but Charles Cheat gives a lot of space to the driver underneath, and that's going to be key later on in the race. Are those drivers going to get closer and closer together and be a bit more aggressive? I think that... If that's what's going to start happening, that's when we're going to see the wreck happen. And that's the thing. It's, you know it's a ticking time bomb. It's almost like every super speedway. You know it's coming. You just don't know when. You don't know where. And you don't know how big. Well, we almost saw an incident there. Uh, AJ Hobson had to fall back massively. He almost That could have taken out a ton of cars. Luckily, AJ backed out of it. But that's something that he might not back out of it later on in the race if these drivers get that aggressive. I'm just thinking that some of these guys are... We've seen it before where some of these guys go right down to that line, that yellow line down there, and hold their line, and the people on top just keep coming down. And that's the thing where you kind of have to make your choice where you're going to hold that line or just really end up turning that guy to the inside wall. Yeah, especially behind the leaders, too. The leaders, they have all that air in the front. It allows them to make the corners at high speed, at full throttle. But if you're behind them, it's really, really hard to keep it down on the bottom as Nunez comes in for the final pit stop of the day. He pretty much comes in alone from the middle of the field there. And so there's going to be a oh, mix of strategies looks like Matt Wagner has also on. joined them. That's what, that's what I'm kind of concerned about, trying to see if there's some trickery being played here. Oh, Gael Brooks as well. He came in early. He was the dri one of the drivers who came in later than most of the rest of the field. But he came in very, very early. But I thought I saw a glimpse of him spinning it at the exit of the pit lane. Oh, and I'm just checking my own cameras, looking at him. Looked like Guy Brooks spun out at the exit of the pit lane. So his strategy to try and undercut everybody and gain track position has completely backfired as he made a mistake on the pit exit. And that's one of the big things that really shoot you in the foot here. Looking at, looking at Brooks, 
He had a pit stop of 5.3 seconds. He was going to get out a pretty much a giant lead from the back two. And unfortunately, with that spin, that really takes him out of contention. Now, one thing I do want to notice that Matt Wagner and Luis Gonzalez, their really pit stop time was 7.7, 7.5 seconds. So they didn't, they, they obviously took less service. Oh no, Jim Brooks. Jim Brooks got hit with a speeding penalty, 45.5 seconds in his box. That is a telltale, telltale sign. As the pressure goes on, these drivers know this is the final pit stop. They're trying to capitalize as much as they can, and we're seeing a lot of mistakes now that we hadn't seen earlier on in the day. The draft was saving them early on, but they thought maybe there wasn't enough laps to catch back up, and now that they're trying to make that spot time up on pit lane, it's biting them. And you got to try everything you can, but you just got to make sure you're pushing the limits, not bending, or really not breaking the limits. Here's a key right here. Nick DeGroote, who pit from the lead has caught on to the back of the lead pack just barely. He's going to be able to catch up to them before they pit. If he gains enough track position going through the pit lane, Rick Ravon from the lead is coming to the pit lane as well. That's going to be key, hooking on to this lead pack, because if you can hold on, you're going to have a pretty solid lead over the rest of the field when they come in. And Nick DeGroote also in that crowd that did a 7.6 second pit stop. So obviously these guys are taking a little bit less fuel, maybe a little bit less service to get out a little bit quicker. And you see the effect it has. Nick the Groot fighting in that main pack. Yeah, he just heard a couple of the drivers ahead of him on the radio saying they're going to come into the pit lane. So he's making the move on them while they can, while he could still get draft off of them. But there's two drivers who's still out ahead of him. Eric Schaus, and I believe that's Nunez as well. Nunez actually did pit, so he's actually racing with the Groot for the lead here. And you guys, think that's the main thing. Now, really, if... De Groot, or sorry, uh, yeah, De Groot and uh, Nunez really kind of using that thinking cap. I would try to make almost a three-car straight file line, try to make it between the three of us. Let's not worry about involving other people in our battle. Let's try to make a three-car train, get as far ahead as possible in that last two laps. Let's battle it out. Let's just make it against us three so we know we're going to get the top three regardless. Well, they're going to have to catch up to Ravon in front of them, who ended up jumping all of them in the pit lane by a good margin. Not far enough to break the draft, but definitely far enough to retain that lead, especially since one of the drivers behind him still has to make a pit stop. So as long as he holds his lane in front of him, it's going to be hard for those other drivers to make the pass as they're forced to go around the outside. I will say either Rick Ravon planned it perfectly or he is riding a very thin edge. He had a 6.5 second pit stop. So either he really took a little bit less fuel or he saved a lot of fuel and thinks he can make it to the end or he's really kind of gambling and hoping that, hey, I'm going to ride behind these guys and save a little bit of fuel. Well, that was extremely close between Nunez and Ravon. Nunez made a very, very late move to go around the outside of Ravon, almost tagged him in the right rear quarter. Here comes Charles Teed with enough power to go straight around the outside. That was a full-on power move from Char from uh, Nick DeGroote, sorry. Yeah, I, said, I was looking at him like, man, Charles Teed must be a ghost because he is fast. <laughs> Apologies, I'm so used to talking about those two racing for the lead that uh, I got my brain messed up. But here comes Ravon trying to come back at him, but not enough of a run. DeGroote made a fantastic move to get enough of a run to sh clear him before turn three. And you just see the, kind of the big run down here. And just looking back in the pack, it looks like Charles Teed's going to be kind of a big loser out of this one. He will be stuck one lap down. Not exactly sure what happened to him. From that seems like to me is that there was either a pit road penalty or a pit road incident like we saw Gile Brooks. So I, unfortunate for him, he was a very, very strong driver today, but that's pretty much going to take him out of it. Although I'm looking at one of the names that's up here who will end up being in the top five when everybody <laughs> pit cycles through. Matt Wagner leading that second pack with the leaders battling like that. He's going to be the first car in line to be able to make the maneuver for the lead. I told you Wagner's sneaky like that. He will, he will play in this entire race. It may not result in a win, but obviously a top five is a great improvement. I mean, I can't emphasize enough just how unfortunate the weeks have been for Matt Wagner in, in case of you know his strategies, his on-track incidents, and problems that he's had. So this is a fantastic return to form for a two-time winner this season. He's looking to grab a third one and start to claw back some of the points that he's lost over the past few weeks. 
And you see Eric Schaus, Schaus is running like a madman, just trying to stay ahead of all these guys. And Schaus yeah, actually really managed to... Schaus had the, I guess, second quickest uh, box time today as a 5.5 seconds. So he's another one of all of those on that kind of razor-thin edge of, can he make it? Question mark. Well, he made it a lot further than everybody else, so his shorter pit stop makes sense. Now, the problem is going to be is that I'm hearing a lot of drivers say over the radio because Eric Schaus was on the apron running the line, so now some of them are trying to call him out for it. Luckily, he's moved back above the line. But the drivers behind are going to get a massive run on him as they catch up to him coming down here because he's all by himself, and he has no draft to keep up speed. Realistically, those calls are really realistically on admins, but... Again, I'm kind of in that same boat of, I'm going to do what it takes to win, and if that throws off my competition for just a few laps, I'm going to take it until they tell me to stop. You know, I'm actually checking up on the uh, speeds of these drivers. Eric Schaus looks to be just far enough ahead that with all the battling behind him, they're not actually catching up to Eric Schaus very much. It's a very, very minor gain each lap. So that really makes me start to scratch my head in the fuel category of, since he is running alone at really maximum speed that he can go, did he have enough fuel to make it to the end of this race? I mean, I would definitely imagine that he probably should have enough fuel, but now I'm starting to see, because of uh, Charles Teed's massive run, that single lap alone, he just caught up two tenths to Eric Schaus, and that might be just enough to catch on to that draft. If these drivers realize that they're having struggles catching up to him, they're going to start tag teaming like they're doing right now, Rick Ravon, Nick DeGroote, tag teaming to catch up to Eric Schaus. Absolutely. Charles Teed still lapped down. He is all the way in 16th, but I believe Nick DeGroote is currently on his way up to Eric Schaus. Yep, Nick, Nick DeGroote making, going around Rick Ravon. These two are going back and forth, and they're catching up a lot now to Eric Schaus when before they were struggling to even keep up at all. They've just caught up another two tenths on that single lap, so Eric Schaus' lead is going to dwindle very quickly. That's the main thing. I think what we're trying to get is Nunez to realize that they need to stop fighting to reach Eric Schaus. If they all really kind of work together, getting that straight line, just for a lap or two, they'll end up catching the draft of Eric Schaus and reeling him back in. Well, all now they're within... Yeah, all they're doing right now, you see that backpack with AJ Hobson and Matt Wagner, and they are loving seeing this battle out of the top four because that is just giving them all the time in the world to catch up. Yeah, that, that second pack is only about eight tenths off of Nunez, who's at the back of this one. But now these drivers have caught up to the draft of Eric Schaus. Eric, Rick Ravon's going to have a massive run, at least coming out of turn two. He's going to take it really high going into turn one. He's got a gap behind him, so he's able to do this. Get run back to the bottom off turn two. He's going to try and get a massive run into turn three. He might be a little bit too far back to make the move. He's going to have to wait another corner, but Charles Teed is looking to run the outside to try and capitalize on that as well. All right, we're getting to that five-lap window where you said you would not lift. That's kind of a go time here. Everyone's getting ready to really kind of make their final moves and hope for the best. Well, look at Nunez. Nunez all the way from the fourth spot with a massive run around the outside of Eric Schaus. He's going to try and take the lead. He's stuck around the outside. He's looking to try and come down. Not enough yet. Eric Schaus behind side drafts him going down onto the back straightaway. It's a battle for the front spot between these two. And you see Nunez really trying to take his advantage, trying to force Eric Schaus all the way down to that bottom lane so he has a little bit more room. You see Nick DeGroote on the high side. Nick DeGroote looking to try and get the run as well. Problem is these drivers are too wide. He's going to have to take a really, really wide entry to turn one. That could definitely hurt him going down through the corners as... You don't really lose too much on that bottom. It's why Eric Schaus hasn't lost the lead yet. They're going to have to try and figure out a way to get a big enough run to go around him. And just looking at Nunez, Nunez is still putting the pressure on Eric Schaus. Rick Ravon says, hey, I want to have another shot too. Ravon's coming up the top side. Oh, this has got to be so frustrating for these drivers. They're getting such big runs, but they're not getting enough of a run to clear Eric Schaus around the bottom. Eric Schaus doing a fantastic job of holding that line and not allowing any driver to get to his inside. It's forcing them to take the long way, and it's just not fast enough for them to pass him. Right now, it looks like the really is a battle between the top four. I don't think the bottom five has really a shot to get there. Looks like uh, really the bottom five through nine, or sorry, five through eight is currently about a f good second back. They won't be a factor here in the last two laps unless something drastic happens. 
Well, if these drivers keep mixing it up like this and the drivers behind realize that they're not catching, like I heard a couple of them discussing over the radio, they might start tag teaming to catch up. And are we going to see four wide for the lead? No, Rick Ravon's going to keep it a little bit calm for the moment, but three wide constantly as DeGroote and Ravon all the way up against the outside wall almost trying to get a big run down the back straightaway. Nunez still holding that outside lane. DeGroot looking all the way for three wide. I don't think he's going to have enough of a run to get it in in turn three. He's going to run against the wall again. Rick Ravon looking to try and get around him as Ravon looking to get the big run this time. But Nunez constantly going for that lead is really struggling. These Ooh. two other drivers. Ravon with a big run around the outside. Is he going to be able to clear up just barely? Yes, he will. Ravon to the lead. And that's really going to be those dicey business where Nunez was pushing Shouts down so far. It really allowed Ravon to really kind of have the track to his advantage. Now the key here is Nunez is now taking it three wide constantly. Can Nick DeGroote make the move around the outside? Can Eric Schaus get the lead back after holding onto it for so long? These drivers are going crazy here. Watch Nick Coming DeGroote onto here. the final lap. Four wide going down the front straight away. Rick Rave on Eric Schaus dead even, but Nick DeGroote Nunez dead even around the outside. Rick Ravon leads it for the moment, but Nick DeGroot from behind is looking to get a massive run. Eric Schaus still hanging it around the outside. Nunez taking it three wide. DeGroot actually going to push Eric Schaus up the middle. Contact oh. Nunez. Schaus into the wall. It's between Rick Ravon and Nick DeGroot. Nick DeGroot's going to have a massive run down here coming out of turn four. Is he going to have enough of a run to take it all the way to the checkered? Nick DeGroot, he's going to get the run. Big run down the front straight, but Rick Ravon gets it. And that was a massive wreck in turn, really in the entrance of turn three. And I think it may have been caused just a little bit by the nose of Nick DeGroote. I mean, that was just some extremely close racing there. It looked like the small contact there at the finish. I almost thought Nick DeGroote had it. He just barely did not have enough of a run to get it there at the finish. Unfortunate for Eric Schaus and Nunez, who performed so well there at the finish. We're looking at the replay here. Oh, just slight contact. Oops. Nunez came down. Eric Schaus came up. They tagged each other. And I seriously thought coming out of turn four that Nick DeGroote was going to get it. It just was simply not enough. Yeah, I, I don't even know if really Nick DeGroote made that much contact. But just as soon as that right rear got hit by Nunez, it was over for Schaus. Oh, I am lightheaded. That was a crazy finish there between those four drivers. They were going back and forth, back and forth, constant three, four wide right there. It it kind of looked like Shouse kind of got shunted up a little bit into Nunez because it just looked like he suddenly shot up. But with these cars, they're so sensitive. You, you can't really tell. Yeah, you get the runoff of Nunez gets the draft off of two. Pulls alongside. He starts giving a little Chaus a little bit more room, but you see he's pinching him down a little bit. Pinching him down, just trying to get as much room, as much kind of area as possible. And unfortunately now you just kind of go for the ride. Oh wow. Congratulations to Rick Ravon on the win though. What a fantastic move to take it three wide around the outside to clear both Eric Schaus and Nunez who were side by side for three, four laps straight. I mean that was an absolutely perfectly timed move to just barely clear them and come down to get in front of them going down to turn one. What a fantastic race for these drivers and Rick Ravon once again after returning to the series, gets another win here today at Michigan International Speedway. And you got to think, it just, it kind of adds to one of those lures of Rick Ravon of, man, when you finally beat him, you feel like you've accomplished something. Just knowing how sneaky he is and really how much he strategizes for these races. I mean, Rick Ravon, prior to this, had only two starts in this series so far this season has one win and two top fives. That was the win last week at Richmond Raceway and was there battling for the win at the finish there at Kentucky. So he's been at the front of the field at every single race so far and is clearly showing that if you want to try and win this championship, you have to try and beat him because every other competitor is also looking to beat him as well. You got to think that puts a huge target on your back. Oh, wow. What a fantastic <laughs> race to be I, I know. I'm, I'm winded. That last lap really took a lot of energy out of me. Hoping to 
try and see if I could look and find any of these drivers. Also, nice to mention there were a third place finish. AJ Hobson leading that secondary pack there at the finish. There was actually a five thousandths of a second difference between him and Yari Brupacher for the third position. So that was a very tight race just behind the leaders. And we'll say Matt Wagner kind of recovering for a P5. That is a great recovery on the day. All right. Let's see if we could try and drag in our third place finisher here tonight. Missed out on the battle, but... Hello, AJ Hobson. Welcome to the FRN booth. Can you hear us? Yeah, I got you. Well, you came away with a third place finish. Sadly, not in the fight for the win there at the finish, but I, I'm looking at the timesheets. It was a tight one there for the third place at the finish. I mean, what was the racing like all day? Because it was absolutely crazy. Oh man, it was uh, it was for sure one hell of a race. You were able to get a run anywhere on the track that you wanted to, uh, and it was just kind of about it was just kind of about you know keeping your car, you know, positioned where you thought you could get the best run, and you know, kind of just position yourself to have a good pit in because if you kind of got stuck on the outside, you uh, you didn't get a good pit in, and it kind of hurt you when you came out. You didn't quite catch the group, and I know for a few stints there. I mean, Peterson had to leapfrog just to get back up to the, the lead pack. And I mean, it was, it was, I don't know. It was just a crazy race, really. Now I've got to ask with earlier in the race, how it was at any point, did you worry about possibly, you know, getting, <laughs> you saw how close they were racing wheel to wheel. Did you worry about any oh, yeah. time of just getting absolutely just demolished by one of these guys when you're trying to pass to the outside? Yeah, I mean, I know there were a few scares early on in the race with just people needing to check up because this car just produced so much downforce in the front of the pack that you'd, you'd get a big run, like I was saying. And there were times going into turn one where I'd have to just get completely out of the throttle. And, you know, there always is that worry that someone's just going to rear end you and it's going to cause the big one. But, you know, there, there's a lot of talent in this field and we were able to make it, you know, all the way on a on a green flag run, which is pretty impressive, I think. Yeah, I mean, that was just a phenomenal race from start to finish. I mean, you were one of the drivers in that second pack there at the end, so I'm going to be the one to ask you this question. I mean, what did you guys have to do there to try and catch the leaders? Because ultimately, you never did, but you guys looked like at the finish you were starting to get there. When was the moment that you thought you weren't going to get the, get them? Yeah, we, we had to try to leapfrog, but a few times, maybe like the third car in line, you know, maybe didn't understand what we were trying to do, and would contest that outside line so it would just kind of break up the momentum that we had going when we were leapfrogging and if we were able to you know have the first two cars leapfrog leapfrog pretty clean and you know the rest of the people in the back just kind of follow we would have been able to catch them because me and peterson did that twice in the race but we were able to have communication me and eric where we were in the you know the same channel so maybe it was a little more difficult with you know the group i was in coming to the to the finish and it just, it wasn't as smooth as a leapfrog as we should have had to get up there. But I mean, we, I had speed towards the end and kind of all bets were off. I'd say with maybe like three to go, everyone kind of stopped working together and it was just kind of fighting for whatever position you could get there. And we just so happened to time the run right to get third at the end. Yeah, you guys fought extremely hard today and came away with a very respectable third place finish tonight. So who do you have to thank for that tonight? Uh, you know, just the guys we race with each night here at Dark Horse Racing. You know, we, we were able to orchestrate pitting together just so we'd always have a group. And, you know, like I said, Peterson helped me out a lot with the leapfrogging to, to get us back up to that lead pack a couple of times. And, you know, you guys do a great job up here in the booth as well. And I, I, I'm excited to watch the playback of the, uh, the broadcast. I feel like it was pretty exciting. Yeah, we were, we were definitely enthused the entire race. Me and Matt up here enjoying <laughs> enjoying ourselves in the boot, uh, losing our breath and never finding any moments to talk as you guys were constantly racing. So congratulations on putting on a good one for us. I appreciate it. All right, let's see if we can try and drag in our second place finisher for the race tonight. If I could get him down here, just give me a quick second. Hello, Nick DeGroot, Alex Connex, Matthew Rodriguez in the FRN booth. Can you hear us? Yeah, I got you. Well, Nick, you were that close to the win tonight. 
was very strong the entire race, probably most definitely has the most laps led, I imagine, of any other driver in the field. I mean, tell us how hard it was to pass because you were clearly the one at the forefront for most of it and the one at the finish looking to try and do it. Yeah, I uh, I just wasn't laying back far enough to get the kind of run I needed. We saw Rick there. He was way back, not just behind them, but behind me. And he he kind of he kind of got a double draft there when he got the draft from me, and then he got the draft from Luis and Eric when they got side by side, allowing him to uh, clear him. But yeah, I kept trying something else, and it just it just wasn't working. It, it might have worked coming to the checkered flag, but not definitely not to clear him. So uh, yeah, I just need to be a bit more aggressive with how much I was laying back there because it's so hard to pass the leader. The tires really don't wear and you can just hold that bottom all the way home. Now, speaking about being aggressive, bump drafting in an Indy car. <laughs> where, where'd you get that idea from? <laughs> well, I, I wasn't trying to bump draft. I was just trying to get <laughs> real close to, you know, try to give him a little bit of um, but looking back and at first I thought I turned Eric up into Luis, but it looks like the Netco gods do not favor me and it, it reacted like I got into Luis's um left rear and it turned him into eric which sucks either way i i shouldn't have tempted it by getting that close to either of them i should have just swung it up high and tried to get the run coming to line but yeah i thought maybe i could give him a little little more extra umph into the corner so him and rick are more side by side maybe slow them both down a little bit give me give me give me and luisa better chance than them but yeah just just didn't work out two second place finishes at michigan this week uh good point so that's good but man really like to win here it's a great track you talking about points, I mean, your second place championship contender, Craig Forsyth, didn't make the start for the race tonight. And Matt Wagner, even though he comes away with a fifth place finish, you're still going to gap him by a good margin. So how do you feel going into the next race at Chicagoland? Yeah, I'm feeling I'm feeling pretty confident. Um, just just keeping trying to protect that lead because we still have a double points race left with the Indy 500 and. You know, it can give you a false sense of security, like I was saying last week. But, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. I, I'm tired of uh, finishing second to Rick, though. I'd like to get a win next week on him. Um, but, yeah, the good good races for us, nice, consistent races. I think we've been top five in uh, every race this year, with the exception of the first lap wreck at Gateway. So that's, that's pretty cool. And uh, hopefully we can end this season on a high note. Yeah, you ran a fantastic race tonight. Came away with a second place finish that was oh so close to a victory, but you still have to be proud of how you performed tonight. Who do you have to thank for the finish? Yeah, uh, as always, Factory Back Motorsports, Motorsport.com, CoveMore.com, Cowboy Ship, Blaze Pods, Q Draw Move, You All in Detailing, everybody else that supports this team. And uh, yeah, thank you to the setup makers because this was a fun race, definitely. Uh, well, I wish there was a bit more. Uh, tire fall off so the leader would push up a little bit but either way it was still really fun to race it out in a hundred lap screen uh that's that's pretty cool as well all right well thank you for coming in to talk to us nick and congratulations thank you thank you guys all right and then let's of course try and get our race winner into the booth so we could talk to him hello rick ravon alex connix matthew rodriguez in the flat out racing network booth can you hear us uh, do I do I need to push the talk here? No, uh, I guess not. Maybe I don't All know. All right. I guess uh, I'm okay. I, I think we are going to be hearing you. Well, here you are again. Two. Weeks How are you guys row. doing, man? <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm good. Uh, always love bringing Rick Ravon into the booth. It's always a great experience. <laughs> always makes such a show out of it, and always making such a show there on the racetrack. Two weeks in a row, two victories after coming back to the series from hiatus. How are you feeling, man? I'm feeling pretty good. I got to admit, it feels good. I mean, <laughs> a race like this. I mean, guys, come on. This this is Michigan. These these cars were just stuck together like glue. You know, the idea was to stay with the lead pack because you don't. You, you don't want them to get away because once you get past about eight or nine tenths of a second, unless you're swapping with the guy behind you, you there's no way you can catch him because the, the draft is kind of ridiculous with the DW12s. You would think with all that downforce on the car that it would break the air behind it a little bit further. But, uh, you know, so you had to stay with the lead pack. And that was the idea. Um, so we stayed with the lead pack. And then, of course, you know, in the pit stops, you had to get in and out as quick as you could because that's another way you could lose the lead pack and then, you know, it's race over if, if you don't work with the guys behind, depending on how far behind you are. But, you know, those last few laps were just unbelievable, man. They were just intense. 
And, uh, you know, I, I, who was it? Uh, I'm sorry. I think it was Eric Schaus. Uh, was it Nunez? Schaus and Nunez. Yeah. Uh, so I was going to say, if I'm, if I'm wrong, please forgive me. But those guys were just, you know, running one, two, and they were side by side in the bottom. And I'm trying to figure out, okay, well, I got to get by them up top if, if I have a shot at this. Or I have to hope that maybe they wreck. And uh, I happen to be in front when they wreck because we're like, you know, four or five laps to go. So many things were going through my mind, but I just decided, you know what, let me just try this monster run on the outside. And I used Nick. Nick was on the outside, so I had the momentum. I, you know, shot down the inside of him. I got the draft behind it. The two guys in front of me went to the outside and took a shot at it. And when I saw I was clear, I just dropped down to the bottom and it just, it all worked out. I can't believe it. Wow. What a race, man. No yellow flags, no yellows. You know, I, I was just sitting here, and Alex is a little bit new to this, but I remember seeing this a lot last season, and I was just kind of marking off my checklist, like, oh, man, this kind of seems like a Rick Ray Vaughn kind of win. Like, this this kind of seems like his his M.O., his setup here. Oh, I don't know if it's a it's a my, my kind of a win. I, mean, I, I don't know. I don't even know how to interpret that. I mean, <laughs> like I said, I, I, had to, I had to figure something out there uh, towards the end of the race, and uh, it just it just worked out. I took a shot up top. It was the only it was the only place where you had to make a run, and it, I was able to clear him. And just thank God, I was able to hold him back there after that. I mean, you talked a lot about that run and how big you had to have it. I mean, we saw a lot of failed passes for the lead tonight. It looked so difficult to try and pass a guy once he got glued there on the bottom lane and he got a bunch of guys around him. I mean, what was the key to making that move for certain? Because it was seems so hard today. Well, you had to you had to start your run from about fifteen or sixteen miles back, and get that get that. Uh, I mean, the, the top speed, you know, as much speed as you possibly can. Slingshot out at the last second and hope that you have enough momentum uh, to clear them. Because you know, once if you try to pass on the outside here, um, if if you don't get a big enough run. Uh, if you don't get a big enough run, the car is just going to, you're going to get about halfway up on the guy. You're going to have half a car length going into, let's say turn three or turn one. And the car is just going to kind of die on you, you know, because the wind is hitting the car and, and you're, you're not going to have enough momentum to get by. So if you didn't take a big, huge run, you just, you weren't going to be able to clear them. Yeah. He, he made the move by laying back by seven Michigan international speedways yeah, to get really. the move done down in a turn one and two. <laughs> Came away like with it. a victory. Just barely, though, Nick DeGroote almost got you. You held on to the finish, though, and you came away with the victory. Who do you have to thank for that? Um, I want to thank Nick DeGroote for making his run too late. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. I love that guy, Nick DeGroote. I mean, if there's anybody who's close to Rick Mears on the racetrack, it's him. Cool, calm, and collected, uh, biding his time. Just very smart out there. I love racing with him. A.J. Hobson did a great job finishing third. I guess Yari was fourth, and who was who was fifth? Matt Wagner? Matt Wagner. My man, Matt Wagner, was fifth. Uh, congratulations to the top five. This uh, – oh, there was somebody talking. I'm sorry. Uh, let me turn that down. Um, did you hear that? Okay. Anyway, uh, so I want to thank those guys. I want to thank everybody that raced clean. I can't believe it. No yellow flags here at Michigan when everybody was just really up each other's rear ends the whole race long. and No yellows. Awesome job, guys. Thanks to FRN and you guys, Alex, Matthew, for uh, calling the race uh, in the booth. Um, I can't wait to watch it later. Thanks to Charles Teed and, um, uh, you know, for uh, – God, I'm just – I'm so tired. I'm so, I'm so sorry. For the league, Eric Peterson. Um <laughs> Thanks to Jesus, my Lord and Savior. I love you so much, Jesus. Thank you so much for the life you've given me. Um, who am I forgetting? Thanks to oh my wife, my wife upstairs. Where are you, honey? Are you gonna come down? Are you gonna come down and make a scene like you normally do with your woohoo, yay, honey? <laughs> and she's nowhere to be found, but she watches everywhere. I want to say a special hello to uh, my man Jay Z, who watches and follows my uh, sim racing career. I'm sure he's thrilled with tonight. Um, and just thanks to everybody, man. Thanks to the fans. Thanks to the people who tuned in and uh, watched this awesome race tonight. God, this I, man, I missed racing with these guys. You know, I, I took, I was on a hiatus. I was working late. Uh, I was able to come back, and I'll tell you, I missed racing with these guys in Dark Horse. This is awesome. 
Anytime you come in here, you seem to make a show out of everything. You make everything really entertaining, and we hope to see you back next week because, my gosh, these races are made by you, it seems. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> You're giving me a little, a little too much credit there. The race is made by the whole field. The whole field races hard, and they race clean. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what it's all about. You have such talented guys in this field. And uh, so that just makes it even sweeter, you know, when you come away with a win because you've really accomplished something, especially considering this isn't the IR-18. It's not like, you know, you have adjustments to make and maybe somebody hits the perfect roll bars and weight jacker and all of that, and then so they have, like, a slight advantage. There's no advantage here. It's all about uh, driving ability, outthinking people and stuff like that. So when you win and it's absolutely 100% heads up, uh, you know, equal, that just makes it so much better. So I, I love this league. Otherwise known as... I'm better than the field. Now, can the field catch me? That's what we're looking to see because so far you've gone two weeks in a row undefeated, and we're looking to see for those drivers to bring it back to you in Chicagoland. Well, that would be great. We'll be looking for the hat trick next week. But I'll tell you what, it, it, I don't know anybody watching. They think that, I don't know if they think I make it look easy, but believe me, I'm. It's it's not easy at all. It's it's extremely difficult to beat these guys. So to come away with uh, two in a row here is. I mean, it's just a privilege. It really is. I love Dark Horse, man. Go Dark Horse! Dark Horse always seems to put on a show. You always seem to put on the show whenever we get to talk to you. Thank you for coming in to talk to us, Rick Ravon. It's always a treat, and congratulations on another win. Thank you so much. Thanks for covering our great sport here, and uh, I look forward to seeing you guys next weekend, hopefully in victory lane again for the hat trick. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was the Dark Horse W12 Racing Series here at Michigan International Raceway. Another barn burner here for this league. I mean, these guys always put on a show, right, Matthew? Well, got to think. I mean, I'll, I'll even echo uh, Rayvon's really comments there. Where the talent in this league is stacked. I mean, it, it looks like it, it may be in favor of all one driver, but I'm going to guarantee you, it is a constant challenge. These cars are a constant challenge, and the drivers are a constant challenge. To, I mean, they are. I don't want to say they're the best, but again, they are almost second to none. Yeah, these drivers every week. You can't really tell who exactly is going to end up winning the race at the end of the day because it just seems like throughout the entire race is always somebody who seems like they have the winning strategy, somebody who seems like they've found the pace, and you never know who ultimately is going to win, but. There's a couple drivers here and there who seem to have the edge at the moment, and those are the drivers like Rick Ravon, Nick DeGroot, Wagner, and Forsyth, who sadly didn't make the race tonight. All those drivers seem to have a bit of an advantage so far this season. Absolutely, and I'm just I'm trying to gear up towards Chicagoland, and I'm thinking about Chicagoland. That is going to be more or less kind of like a Kentucky-style race, but definitely a little bit sharper of corners, and I think it's going to be a little bit more lifting than we expect. Yeah, Chicagoland's going to be really interesting. Very bumpy racetrack as well. Gives you a lot of opportunities to run a bunch of different lanes as well. Kentucky was a li bit more single file, but there at Chicagoland, there's a lot more places to go. So it's going to be really fun here next week. Absolutely. And got to think, there's a lot of guys who've got a lot of things to prove, and there's a lot of ground to be made up in this championship. A lot of ground to made up in the championship for sure. Just a couple weeks away from the double points race at Indianapolis. Make sure you catch that one as well. But until then, make sure you catch us next week here with the D Dark Horse Racing DW12 Series. I'm Alex Kalnix alongside Matthew Rodriguez, and thank you for tuning in. This broadcast is the copyrighted work of Flat Out Racing Network and may not be rebroadcast, retranslated, or used in any form without the express written consent of Flat Out Racing Network and iRacing.com Motorsports Simulations. Flat Out Racing Network would like to thank you for your support and we hope you enjoy.